He's the conservative Christian cowboy from MTV Real World Los Angeles 1993. I'm Tate Ellison and Shauna Joyner joining me for Banter for Believers. Uh, John Brennan here with us from formerly, let's see, what is it, 26 years ago, uh, you did uh, MTV Real World, and since then, you have been a pastor, a youth pastor, a worship leader, and am I cutting out on you guys, or is that just my uh, ears, that's just my ears, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so John, thank you for so much for joining us here this morning for the show, uh, Banner for Believers, and um, to, number one, you, you just had a concert last week uh last weekend is that correct i was part of a of a charity fundraiser for a volunteer fire department yeah it was awesome okay really. and where was that it was in white house tennessee just north of nashville okay and uh man i got asked to be part of something really cool uh, it was a bunch of well it was you remember the rock group tesla yes yes i do <laughs> i think they were there yeah <laughs> it, only 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 older folks no, no, no young spring chicks know them. They had like uh, a country section of the, of the, of the charity. And it was, uh, let's see, it was Florida Georgia Lions drummer, a guy named Sean, an incredible drummer. Blake Shelton's guitar player, a guy named Kevin Post. He plays steel guitar and electric guitar. Darius Rucker's guitar player, a guy named uh, Quentin. Awesome. Just incredible. Uh, Brett Eldridge's bass player. And then, and then they got together and they, and then they said, Hey, we, we, uh, we need a singer. And so the guy that used to play keyboards for me, um, was in the band. He played the Hammond organ and said, I know a singer. And so they called me and said, would you sing with these guys? I'm like, uh, yeah. Wow. So, yeah. That was, that was a, a whole, just a mod podge. <laughs> well, it was a charity and I think they live in the area and you know, those guys, they all end up seeing each other out on the road and in, in Nashville. And I think it was a chance for them just to do something cool together. They probably don't get to play together very often. Sure. And then they ended up with, Hey, we don't have a lead singer. And so that was, it was awesome. It was really good. You were the I, I have to tell you, I have never sang with a band that was as good as they were. And we practiced for about 90 minutes that day, and then we just went for it. And, and you've opened for uh, people like Tim McGraw uh, uh -huh. and, and some others. I've opened for lots of big people. Tim McGraw, uh, Alabama is probably the highlight for me because I did several shows with them, and they're my heroes from when I was little. Well, still kind of my heroes. And then uh, who else? I, I opened for Eddie Rabbit, Shenandoah, Marty Stewart. Lots of people, Neil McCoy, uh, you know, just that those are the fun things you get to do sometimes. I haven't got to do those in a long time. Oh, well, good. Well, good. Yeah. We're, we're going to get you back, back on the uh, track here and uh, yeah. need some more, more gigs. How about that? <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> That's what I'm shooting for. I'm actually, uh, actually never told anybody this publicly, but, um, if you're going to put this on the web, then that'd be fine. Uh, cause I, I'm ready to start talking about, I'm uh, re-gearing up and I'm trying to do uh, a, a show. I'm calling it a show in Nashville because I want the public to come to it. Um, but I want to use it as a showcase too and try to invite some industry people and, and just kind of hit reset and try to get back on track with some music. Absolutely. No, I, I grew up or I lived in Nashville. I, say, I keep saying grow, grew up. I, I grew, I you haven't grow grown up, up anywhere, yet. But yeah, he, nobody yeah, in Nashville grew up. up. So I did a little bit of growing up in Nashville a little bit. Yeah. So anywhere I go, I'm, I'm still growing up, but uh, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for a while and I, I actually had the same breathing space as uh, uh, Tim McGraw, but I never actually got to, he was across the, the aisle from me at a, at a movie theater in Franklin, Tennessee, but I didn't actually yeah. get to meet him. But um, you know, the funny thing about Tim McGraw, uh, I loved his first album and he, he never, he never hit until his second album. And so like literally nobody knows he had a first album, but I happened to be in a restaurant and you know, I, he, he kept looking at me and I thought, man, he's staring at me. Cause I keep looking at him cause I'm a big fan and I keep, you know, looking at him like, Hey, there's one of my, I'm girl, you know, I'm just a 
a fan and, and he's, you know, getting ticked off that I keep staring at him. So he, 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 he does like this. I'm like, dang, he's going to be like, quit looking at me, dude. And he says, sit down. Didn't I see you on TV? I'm like, yeah. I said, dude, I got your first record. I love it. He goes, oh, you were the one that bought it. And uh, I hadn't seen him in like 25 years. The one that I bought mean, it. in concert, but I wish I could say we were buddies when we hang out. But uh, yeah. uh, he was really super cool to me. I mean, and, and I saw him maybe four or five times after that. And he always called me by name. And, and then when on the show that I opened for him, he, uh, he snuck up behind me backstage, kind of, you know, with his baseball hat on and, and uh, before he went on and just was really friendly, but he, he was, a, he was a nice guy. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, you know, I loved uh, Nashville. I loved Tennessee. The atmosphere, I had family there. And my claim to fame was that I actually sold George Jones uh, a pair, uh, about $900 worth of women's jeans because Willie Nelson told him they fit better. So, uh, I wait, was, wait, 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 yes, we need, we need George to call TMZ or write a book. <laughs> hey, hey, let me say it. True really, story. It's a true story. If yeah. I had a dollar for every time somebody did that. To me. <laughs> yes, I had to do it. I had to do it. Matter of fact, can you do it for us right now? Uh, you know, the funny thing about that story uh, was uh, they, uh, you know, when I was out there in California, I was 18 years old. And of course, country music was really huge. It was 1993. And they said, hey, you know, we got this intro. This is the true story of seven strangers picked to live in a house and find out blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I've heard that because they had one season before me. And uh, they said, we want you to sing it in your Dwight Yoakam, Kentucky country voice. And I'm like, this is the true story. And they just started falling out laughing. I'm like, <laughs> And they said, that's all we need right there. It's all we need. And so <laughs> the clip. anyway, everywhere I go. Yes. Yes. So I, I think it, it was just uh, recognizable. I mean, I think even after that, it was the most recognizable. Um, I've started a true story hashtag. Have you? Yeah. I think everybody else has used it for oh, their, their own. You know, I mean, it's not like I coined it, but. Yeah, anyway. absolutely. Well, uh, t tell me now, where are you living right now? Now I know you, you were Kentucky. Uh, yeah, Los Angeles for the show. You you went to uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Florida. Yeah. Where 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 have you landed here? I've lived in Birmingham twice. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm right now in rural Alabama. Um, I call it Mayberry. It's in it's in uh, it's near Talladega, but it's it's Ashland, Alabama. Okay. And it's a uh, it's a small town. It's a great town, and uh, it's uh, you know right now I'm working at a church as a youth pastor. I'm leading worship. Uh, you know, getting to do some things musically there and uh, just having a great time. And my mom is still in Kentucky. She's living in Lexington, Kentucky, which is not where we lived when I was growing up. My hometown's Owensboro, Kentucky, oh, which wow. was all the time was mentioned on the, on the, on the real world. So everybody still thinks, you know, Owensboro, Kentucky's where, where I am, but it's where I'm from and kind of where I wish I was sometimes. Cause I love that place, but I lost my dad in March. So just, uh, just over six months ago, and uh, mom and dad had both lived in Lexington, Kentucky. So that's kind of when I go visit mama, that's where I go. Does she ever just, when are you coming home, son? When are you coming home? Daily. Move in with me. <laughs> Daily. <laughs> I don't think any mom, I, every mom does this, I think. So that's universal. Which is okay. You know, you always want to know if everything falls apart, I still got mom. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, good. So uh, let me ask you, how, how big is your church? This church is about, um, I think about 200, 200 people. You know how churches are. There's about 400 people that say they go to them. And then there's about a half show up. And the other that actually show up. They're on the membership <laughs> roll. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they're so not that, tithing. They're not tithing. So, you know, are they really members? Man, you're about to get me preaching. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We don't talk about those kind of things in, in churches. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what has been the most difficult? I mean, what is the age gap at your church? I mean, what what are, what are the age ranges at your church? Huh. Uh, we have uh, we have probably the oldest one in our church is ninety two, okay, and then we have infants. So I mean, it's it's uh, this church to, to be really honest with you is not unlike a lot of churches. The elderly are, are um, you know, one day they're going to go be with the Lord, <laughs> one day maybe soon. And then it's time for the it's time for the younger people to kick in for that faithfulness because the you know old people in church, they're faithful, uh, financially, right. prayerfully, attendance, they're faithful people. 
Yeah, the millennials aren't coughing up the bucks to keep a church in business, right? Now. They do a lot. They cough up a lot of bucks, but not to be faithful to the Lord. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, honestly, it's time for the millennials to uh, to start to be faithful because, I mean, millennials have a reputation for not being believers in Christ. I don't buy that. I think that they are. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they're, they're not real faithful to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, my parents, uh, my dad was a worship leader or he was the music director and then my mother was a pianist, but they tried very hard. We, we grew up in, a, in about similar size church, 150, maybe 200 people, half of those showed up. Uh, but um, it was always very difficult for them to uh, get the, the youth and the, uh, the, the elders of the church together on the worship uh side you know that one group wanted the hymns the other one the more worship and there was always that constant battle of tension there hey we need more hymns this sunday oh we need more worship you kind of well, same spirit. So it's so funny you said that because tomorrow morning sunday morning we're doing all hymns now we won't use the organ because really even the older folks have stopped liking the organ it's time to unplug all organs all right but just piano like no drums no guitars just the piano and the hymns, and we're not going to do a crazy version of them. We're going to do a straightforward, traditional version, and uh, that's that's not something we've ever done, sure. but it's something that um, I want to communicate to the people that are lovers of the hymns. Um, you know, we're not anti-hymn here. Um, we'll do them, and you know, I like to do them David Crowder style or Chris Tomlin style. I like that but not everybody does. And so it's kind of like, you know, when you remake a song, it's like, Oh, I like the original version better. Hey, that's cool. So we'll do the original version uh, tomorrow. But the mu music is such a big part of who we are, um, whether it's country music or worship music or whatever music you enjoy, music stirs the emotions. And when you're worshiping, that also stirs the emotions. So music is a big part of worship. Preaching is a big part of worship. Tithing is a big part of worship. Praying is a big part of worship, but, um, but music is a big part. And so um, I'm trying to bridge the gap because um, like, I don't, I'm not a big fan of the dance techno, you know, worship songs that are out there. That's not to me worshipful. It might be celebratory, but it's not worshipful. Hmm. Um, but I'm not against it. I'm just don't use it in, in our worship services. But uh, I think we need to bridge some gaps and, and hymns are a real cool way to bridge those gaps. Cause um, David Crowder is probably the coolest cat on the planet. And he, he, he does those hymns in a really cool way that everybody can like, I think, but it's, you know, music's like everything else. It's a matter of opinion. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Have you, uh, have you been on the circuit with any uh, Christian artists? No, no, I've met several. Uh, oddly enough, uh, the founder and lead singer of audio adrenaline is from my hometown. Mark, Mark Stewart. Stewart. Yeah. And, um, what he lived out in the county a little bit. I lived in a small, Owensboro is kind of a small town. And then he lived out in a smaller town, but near me. And, uh, you know, so I know him. Uh, I, I actually met Bart from Mercy Me um, at, a, at I, I was emceeing a big, huge, uh, it's called the Atlanta Fest, a big, huge music conference or a music festival. And, and he walked up to me right, but right when their big record deal hit. And I can only imagine was going mainstream because it was kind of out before, but then it went big time. Uh, and he walked up to me and said, you don't remember me, do you, John? I'm like, no, but dude, I love you. I love your song. And he said, well, we were in Bible study together at a church camp called Centrifuge when we were teenagers. So I'm like, dang. He said, yeah, then I saw you on TV. And I said, I know that guy. I'm like, well, I don't remember that, but I, I, I love you. So, I mean, I don't see him and I talk to him. I, I irritate him on Twitter, but, uh, you know, I know him and he's totally awesome. And, and Mac Powell from Third Day, I got to meet him and got to know him. I, I wish I could say I hang out with him all the time. Cause he's just, he's, he's the realest celebrity I know. I'm just telling you. And he's gone uh, the way of country. I think a lot of people have uh, kind of uh, even considered him a, a sell. If you read the comment section, which you try to avoid, if you're, if you're an artist, I think yeah. but there's a lot of people uh, kind of giving him some, uh, uh, some heck, if you will, about uh, him doing more country folk kind of uh uh, style and moving away from the original not that he's changed uh, anything yeah well i i think that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard and and they criticized amy grant when she did it mm -hmm. and you could name tons of others i'm sure uh, michael w smith went you know completely pop for a while and not anything that you would have to apologize 
to the Lord in front of, you know, in front of Lord tube, but he went pop mainstream. And, and those are some of my favorite artists, but I tell you what, um, you know, third days retired, you're done. And, uh, Max, a country boy. I mean, he, I think Eddie Vedder got his sound from Mac and, uh, well, yeah. audio, audio Adrenaline started off as metal. Like they were, I saw them in 91. They were touring in Southern California in like a white panel van. I think it said free candy on the side. But their first t-shirt that I had, and this was at Point Loma um, University down in Southern California. First t-shirt I had that was Audio Adrenaline said, if you're happy and you know it, bang your head. Yeah, I think I've seen that shirt. And yeah, there was, I'm pretty sure, a mosh pit. And <laughs> well, you know, Christian artists are real people. And here's the thing you can sing Christian music, and we should, and we do. Uh, I'm not even a Christian artist, I'm just a Christian that sings. I lead worship in church and I sing country music, and I got to watch my lyrics. But if you can meet a, a Christian and you can, you can find a, a more true blue one than Mac Powell just in personality and spirit and genuine fervor for Jesus. You can't, I'm just telling you, you can't. I, I, and, and it's going to sound ridiculous, but I put him up there with the integrity of Billy Graham. I'm just telling you, if you spend five minutes in the room with that guy, the integrity of, 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 of Mac and some of these others we've named, you just, they're just real. And, and, and I don't understand the criticism to be honest, because Jesus tells us to go out into the world. He, you know, and, and, yeah. I mean, a lot of Christian music is just preaching, preaching to the choir. At some point, preaching right? to the choir. I mean, I mean, some of these people that are criticizing these artists for doing that have never shared Christ with anybody. They've never gone on a mission trip inside the country or outside the country. So I, I don't, I take that criticism lightly, but a lot of people do it. You're right. Yeah. I can see your feathers ruffling a little bit when you're talking. Well, about I mean, for goodness sake, <laughs> God put me on MTV in the nineties. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there wasn't a darker place. Well, so, so I read that uh, here on an interview, I guess it was a 20-year uh, kind of reunion, MTV was catching up with you, and you, and you were talking about that it was, MTV was outlawed in your home. You, you had that channel <laughs> blocked, and then the first thing you do is go apply to be on MTV. Well, I didn't apply. Big level move right there. Yeah, I didn't apply for it. Um, I'll tell you how that happened, but it, it was blocked from my TV, but uh, to be honest, we, we didn't we didn't watch it. My dad had us listen to country music and my sister and I were church rats. We didn't have any desire to watch it. And then when I went, I started singing country music in about 1990, 91, when I was in high school and graduated 92, I went to Belmont university and they had done one season of the real world and they came to Nashville looking for a country singer. And that's how they did with the next season. They, they went to San Francisco looking for a bike messenger and that's where they found puck. And so I never applied and uh, I don't know how they're casting now, but for the longest time I was the only cast member that had never really actually formally applied. I mean, they knew what they wanted and they said, would you like to be on MTV? We got this show. And I'm like, no, number one, that sounds dumb. And number two, I don't want to be on MTV. Number three, I don't want to move to California. And number four, I'm a country music singer. What is your problem? And they looked at me and said, you are perfect. Like we want, <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yes. So that's how that happened. But so I remember one of my favorite scenes off of Real World. You're talking to was it David? He was a comedian. Uh, yeah. And, he was a comedian, but he wasn't very funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I did get a kick out of him when you're talking about Christian music, and you mentioned DC Talk. <laughs> uh, we were still in their hip hop days oh. back back yeah. at that time. Before Naughty that. by Nature. And, yeah. And, and, that was his favorite. Yeah. And and he's and you said yeah you heard DC talk and he's like well, DC, who it's not supposed yeah. to be I'm nice I'm yeah I'm nice you know? and he and David was from Washington DC and he hadn't heard of DC talk oh that's funny so I'm just like you know such a poser but yeah DC talk I mean look at how they evolved and and, and everything that they did now they're you know separate artists but um, my favorite thing they ever did was was the uh, Jesus is just all right, you know. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> the old Movie awesome. Brothers classic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, uh, and, and we're hoping that you know, Kevin and I have uh, he, he expressed interest to be on the show too, so we're hoping to have him pretty soon uh, as well. We're, they're actually going to be in Abilene here in November, I think, with Newsboys. 
Awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Kevin's with the Newsboys. Well, he's not with the Newsboys now, but he's he's making an appearance. Uh, Michael sings with the Newsboys, and Michael Kevin's going to be a special guest. He's going to be a special guest. That's correct. Well, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and I think he's going to do his own stuff, and then also uh, <clears throat> whatever that what, – what is that? God's Not Dead? That's where he kind of is featured on here recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we got big stuff happening in Abilene. <laughs> yeah, what, what is that close to? I know Texas is really spread We're out. What's close to nothing. It's well, about two hours away from, from from anything, really. Uh, Dallas, yeah. they weren't right in the central Texas. Okay. Uh, Dallas, we're between Dallas, San Antonio, El Paso. Big yeah. Between- El Paso, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, we're smack between um, like Fort Worth and Midland, Odessa. Yeah. So. Okay. Isn't there a sign when you leave uh, Louisiana heading towards Dallas? And it says, when you hit the state line in Texas, it says El Paso, Texas, 900 miles or something like that. Oh, yeah, something yeah. like that, yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I'm not exaggerating. It's, it's a crazy amount of very high hundreds of miles. Yes. It, it takes some getting used to if you're yeah. from the smaller states there that uh, doesn't take you long to travel through. So, yeah. But, uh, um, yeah, so- I'm not even from a smaller state. And I grew up and it was four hours to Cali, four hours to Vegas and four hours to Mexico. Here it's oh, four wow. hours to Texas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Exactly. You can go four hours one way and you're in Texas. You go Listen, four hours I, I, this is probably off topic, but uh, I, I spoke at a at a university once and I flew into uh, probably Dallas first and then Midland Odessa. And then I drove forever, like forever, rented a car and drove. It was in Alpine, Texas, Sol Ross State University. Wow. You know where that is? I mean, I thought yeah. I was driving. You look at, look up Alpine, Texas. I mean, it is. And it, I thought I was driving for, I felt like, um, you know, the end of uh, the movie Castaway. Yes. That's where I was. That's where I thought I was. Anyway. That's so, what was your most eye-opening experience uh, having been in, you know, you came in there, uh, you know, I'm a civic conservative Christian and, and you <laughs> enter this whole other world. Uh, you know, I don't like to label, but you know, uh, we have labels. People don't like to be labeled, but then we label everything. Uh, True. At odd. Uh, but uh, you go into this and, and you're experiencing this new world. And I, I know it initially at the beginning, it took you a while to kind of adapt or kind of, it took you a little bit of, uh, yeah. Change. Yeah. And that was for a lot of reasons. One was at the time I was the youngest person to ever be cast on a real world. And I, I'd only been 18 years old for, well, I guess I've been 18 for six months. So I was 18 and a half years old and one semester of college. And I, and I moved from Nashville, which Nashville in the nineties is nothing like Nashville is now. They say a hundred people a day moved to Nashville. So Nashville is a huge, very trendy place and, and music is still there, but it's, it's got, it's got everything going on. I mean, this was before they had a hockey team, before they had a football team. This is the nineties, early. It's still the and, Houston Oilers, by the way. Yes. Yeah. We stole the Houston Oilers and then we're the Titans now. And then Houston got another team, which is weird to me. But anyway, <clears throat> so I came from Nashville from Kentucky and um, I was 18. Well, every other person I lived with was from somewhere else, but lived in Los Angeles at the time. So they had, you know, their car, their friends, their job, their apartment that they would go to and hide out whenever stress got to. I didn't have any of that. So I was just like, everybody here in Los Angeles is crazy. This place is godless. And I'm living in a house on MTV. This is, this is dumb. And it was stressful. I took a long time to adapt to everything. I mean, LA is a zoo. And I had been to LA as a child, but I, you know, I think we, you know, went to Disneyland. Like we didn't spend, we didn't hang out while well, I was living there. And we lived in Venice, which is, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, it's kind of the <laughs> armpit of Los Angeles. I, I went to college in LA County. So okay. I feel like, yeah, that was kind of the same when I was there for college and I was at a Christian yeah. university. Yeah. <laughs> well, one night. Like, these are different Christians we have in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you're you from Arizona? Yes. Where? Um, outside Phoenix, Mesa. Okay. So I, my daddy was in the FBI, so I lived everywhere. I'm actually not from Kentucky. Uh, well, I'm from Kentucky, but I was born in Wisconsin, lived in Paradise Valley, Scottsdale. Okay. I was born in Scottsdale. Yeah. And so, I've been and to Owensboro too. You've been to Owensboro? <laughs> yes. We need to hang out more. I had to drive there after my grandfather's funeral to I'm get so a sorry. beer because You've that got was to drive the there. nearest 
dry or wet county. Yeah. yeah. Well, I know that you're a Texan, <laughs> but we are in Owensboro, the barbecue capital of the world. So, so. so. But yeah. But yeah, I, I mean, Los Angeles was a very hard place to get used to. And then the circumstances were very stressful. And here I'm living with, you know, the craziest people God ever made. I mean, honestly. And we were, to say we were diverse is, is not even touching it. But, you know, what I realized quickly is it, as strange as they were to me, I was to them. They could not relate to a, a, a kid that sings country music from Kentucky wears a cowboy hat like Garth Brooks and got saved by Jesus when he was five years old. They, they couldn't relate to me. I mean, I was an alien to them. And uh, here's a part, even uh, one, I mean, actually my proudest moment of the real world ever is when, you know, Tammy, who she and I are, are, are great friends now and love one another a lot. But, uh, you know, we had this big fight about she was a Muslim and I was a Christian and I was narrow minded and I thought Jesus, you know, anyway, she ended up having an abortion on the show and, Instead of judging her, I, I, you know, loved her and, you know, still very much against that decision um, and that choice. But um, I had an opportunity to, to not come across as a hateful, judgmental Christian. And just can I just realize that she's made this decision and this is going to happen and how can I respond to it? And so thankfully, they portrayed it just like that. And they didn't really manipulate anything. And that was a fear that I had. Well, this MTV, even if I say the right thing, they're going to totally. But they never did that to me. Let me let me say that on the record. MTV never misedited me and misrepresented me. That's never. fantastic. I was actually going to ask. If it's a miracle. And 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 I, I can say that on my series, they didn't do that to anyone. I, now, the show's gotten kind of crazy and producers have changed. So I don't know how they're doing things now, but from what I lived and what I saw and who I was with and the happenings, they portrayed it the way it happened. Now, some people didn't like the way it looked, but I'm like, well, Dominic, you, you really did do that. So that's kind of the way you were. That. <laughs> I mean, you really were that drunk. So they didn't twist anything. But Tammy looked right into the camera and she, um, she is so mad. Just live it with me. And she's crying and, you know, with lots of, uh, let me turn that off, lots of uh, emotion and, and, and just, gritting her teeth she says john thinks jesus is the only god and she wipes a tear from her eye and they fade off into commercial and they play the in vogue song free your mind oh yeah and i'm like they're trying to make me look bad but for somebody to look into a camera on mtv and say john thinks jesus is the only god i'm like that might be the best thing that could ever be said about me on international television <laughs> and i mean i didn't have to say a thing so yeah I thought that was cool. Well, let me ask you, what what do you, I think everybody goes through at, at some point, maybe maybe that's not you, but I, I think a crisis of faith or where they just reevaluate what they believe. Did that ever happen? For, has that happened for you in your life uh, or a period where your your faith has kind of evolved in a different way? I mean, what, what ways, ha, have you had, twofold questions, so have you had a crisis of faith and and uh, how has your faith evolved over time? If well, I, I don't want this to sound arrogant or spiritually arrogant, but the truth of the matter is, and I don't understand all the reasons why, but God saved me when I was five. I lived in Phoenix, Arizona when I got saved, five years old. And I always- it scares you a lot more when you live in Arizona and it gets that hot in the summer. Yeah, 115 <laughs> degrees is a normal day. But I never- I mean, I don't want to say I don't, there's not doubt. I think in order to have faith, you have to have doubt. But I never strayed away from the faith. Like, I mean, I, I, I sin. I, I have daily struggles like everybody else. You want to confess those right now? Yeah, I like to confess those on your broadcast. <laughs> it's scriptural to do so, actually. But no, I mean, I'm ashamed of my sin. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, these people walk around, well, I'm a Christian, but I, I get drunk and I cuss. I'm like, well, maybe be a little less proud of those things <laughs> work on them i'm not going to judge you but but work on those <laughs> don't just say you love to do them but um i always had this uh impression that 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 god was with me and i was to live for him not just enjoy his forgiveness and get into heaven but that was just part of it. Oddly enough, I'm planning a retreat for our teenagers because I believe that the church has preached half, half the gospel. Mm -hmm. Some churches aren't even preaching the gospel, but some churches are preaching half the gospel, which is um, be saved and enjoy the grace of Jesus and go to heaven. 
Well, that's half the gospel. Mm -hmm. The other half is repent, be sanctified, and, and live your life for him and stop living your life for yourself. Right. But that's, that's hard to do. It's like when Jesus said in John chapter 6, eat of my flesh and, and drink of my blood if you want to follow me. And they're like, okay, time out. Weird. You're weird. That's too much. Like I want, I want grace and forgiveness because I need that. I want heaven because that sounds better than the alternative. But that's all. I want to go back to my sinful life and my selfish life. And I'm sorry, that's half the gospel. So, I mean, I, I had good discipleship. People mentored me well. I was in church. I was in Sunday school. And people made sure that I knew the complete gospel. I never strayed away from that. Now, when I met people on the real world that were nothing like me, and now as I've traveled the world, and I have a heart, especially for, you know, the 1040 window, the, un, the unreached people groups that just have never heard the gospel. I mean, my heart's burdened. I went to Hong Kong. Okay, those people aren't Christian. They're, they're Buddhist mostly. And, and, and I've never been to India, but I want to go. These are places that have never really been reached for Christ. And if they've been, been told, it, 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 it hasn't been enough. And we haven't penetrated these countries to share the gospel. But when you meet these people, you, you, you love them. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in love with the continent of Africa. I mean, I'm in love with it. It's contagious. I want to go back. I want to be there for, for extended amount of time. Uh, I, I love to travel and meet people that, that are not Christian. And when I do, I'm burdened for them. So it does make you question yourself and your faith. It makes you go, hey, how can I love this person and this be such a great, wonderful person, but them, according to my faith, be so confused and be on a path that, according to my beliefs, is away from God and, and on a path to hell. Um, and it's always some, some, some people that makes you go, that makes them go, well, then, then my faith can't be accurate. But for me, it doesn't. It makes me go, then, then my faith, I need to kick my actions in and start being obedient and take the gospel to them. Because my faith says, go to all the nations and spread the gospel and baptize them. And so if these people aren't being reached, it's not because God's not real. It's because I'm Christians aren't doing their job. So I'm going to give you one uh, theological uh, question here to go a little bit deeper. What, how do you reconcile a loving God with hell? Easily. And I preach this many times. Everybody knows John three sixteen, but not, uh, not very many people keep on reading. And if you read 17, 18, 19, 20, it describes that, um, God doesn't send you to hell. You send yourself to hell. Jesus is the rescue. You know, God didn't invent sin. We, 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 we enjoy that. <laughs> sure. So God, God's plan was for us to be sinless. Now, Jesus is the rescue. G God does not send us to hell, but by us refusing and denying the rescue in Jesus Christ, we send ourselves there. Our own sin sends us there. God doesn't send people to hell. And it's not his desire that people go there. And we do it to ourselves here on earth. I mean, yeah, by the we, we, we live in or even unforgiveness and, and bitterness. And uh, yeah, we, we, we typically, that's kind of our tendency. Even people that know the gospel, they choose sinfulness over obedience and salvation. Sure. Well, it's that old adage that you're being given a gift. And if you don't open the gift, you can't enjoy what's that's inside. Right. And so you're choosing, if you choose not to open the gift, it's not on God. That's right. It's, well, it's and people you. say, how can your loving God send people to hell? It's like, well, listen, it, God's not fair. He's actually so unfair in our favor that he's actually not a just God. He's an unjust God because he gives us something that we could never earn and don't deserve. So I agree with you. God's not fair. <laughs> There's a little spin on that. You can't argue with me. I was, I am the OG <laughs> of the reality TV. No one argues like a, a real world cast member. You, <laughs> you've heard it all right here. Who thinks that Jesus is the only God? <laughs> yeah, no, that I do. I can't argue with that. Hey, free your mind. I, I should have looked that up so we could just end with that right there. <laughs> oh my God. Invoke. <laughs> Well, John, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this uh, uh, Better for Believers broadcast. Uh, we appreciate you. Is there anything you'd like to just close out with, something that you would just like to uh, to say to our audience uh, here? 
today? Just just pray. Yeah, pray for our nation. Pray for the young people in our nation. I'm 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 burdened for the youth. Statistics say that if teenagers don't choose to follow Christ by the time they're 18, 80% of them never do. So the time to reach, I mean, that's when they're deciding who they're going to be. Pray for our world. The majority of the world is either um, ignorant of Jesus or they're just refusing um, to follow him. And that's, you know, a fatal, very scary decision. Pray for our politicians, our government, our own country. When you leave the United States, and I'm a patriot and I love it and I can't wait to ever get back and have me a Five Guys burger. But when I'm away from it and you meet foreign people that are believers, they're praying for our nation. And, and they should. And, and we don't have it together anymore. Like, we, like you know, uh, USA is, is number one. I love it. But I'm telling you, we're off track. And it's getting worse every day and not better. And there are people around the world praying for us. And we need to stop being so arrogant. We don't have all the answers. And we are not at the feet of Jesus anymore as a nation. And we, uh, we need to be. But even if our nation doesn't get back to it, our homes and our families and us as individuals and believers, we got to stay the course. And you can, be, you can be a pop artist. You can be a Christian artist. You can be a reality TV star. Or you can be a pastor. But the time is coming and now has come as Jesus says, where he's looking for true worshipers and we got to be the real thing. We got to be the real thing. John sounds like you rehearsed that a little bit, man. I should have said this one or two times before. <laughs> Never that well. I should have recorded it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, we got you covered on that. Okay. Hey, John, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. God bless you and, and you and your ministry and your church. And, and we just, uh, uh, we will uh, continue to keep you guys in prayer. And uh, thank you so much for joining us here on Manhood for Believers, man. Thank you. Thanks for what you do.